ready. We have about 120 on the book today, so a nice busy lunch. Gramercy Tavern, like all restaurants, has this great luxury and the responsibility of connecting with the community that it, that it belongs to. The way we've decided to connect is really kind of focusing on education. Can everybody say hi to Chef Jenny from Gramercy Tavern? We get to show them interesting colors and shapes and textures and get them to talk about food, give them some vocabulary words to really latch on and maybe let those kids grow up a little less indifferent to food than, than maybe we did when we were little. And I think about all the, the meals that I've had. They've all they've been anchored to the place, that particular area, something specific about, about that, that town, that country. And they've also been deeply impacted by the particular time of year, what season, even what kind of weather was happening. And you know, when you have that combination of a, a meal that is connected to a time and a place, it seems like those are memories that just never leave you. It's not a piece of artwork that can just be hung on the wall and dusted and admired for years and years. It's, it's constantly changing. It changes with the people who come to work in it, changes with the people who come to, to eat in it. And, uh, and it's important that it stays dynamic and, and constantly looking to, to renew itself. Restaurants, especially in a, a big market like New York City, um, it's a very competitive place. And, uh, you know, a great restaurant is this combination of uh, technical excellence and, uh, and, and a lot of emotion. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for coming to another Food Policy for Breakfast seminar series. I want to welcome you to Hunter College here in East Harlem. And my name is Charles Plack, and I'm the director of the New York City Food Policy Center and a nutrition professor, professor here at Hunter College. Today, we're honored to have several impressive and distinguished panelists. Michael Anthony, the executive chef at Gramercy Tavern. Adam Eskin, founder and CEO of Dig In. Sarah Gatanis, the owner of uh, UGC Eats in East Harlem. Colin McCabe, co-founder of Chopped, and Jay Strauss, founder and co-owner of Westville. So just a few words about my connection to, to some of the panelists. Uh, I consider myself lucky to have met Adam Eskin uh, nearly nine years ago. He came to me as a young entrepreneur to rent a commercial space that I actually own uh, on 17th Street by Union Square. I thought it was a sign that he was focused on healthy farm-to-counter food, and how ironic given my job and interests. Uh, he's proven himself to be smart, fair and incredible and an incredible entrepreneur and a true advocate of the food movement. I know you're surprised by that, <laughs> but I, I do really appreciate the relationship. Um, Colin McCabe, I used to see with his uh, at the very same block on 17th Street, working hard with his partner, his partner Tony at their first store on Union Square, also right in the right in the same area. Always trying to deliver the best food and make all of his customers happy, and it was always really you know rare and, and exciting to see him working so hard. Uh, right at the beginning of his career. Uh, Michael Anthony, I was introduced to by a friend in 2005 or so, and I, uh, again, um, noticed that he was a person of deep integrity and kindness. I ran into him several years later on the same day that that film was shot. I don't know if you're aware of that, uh, but that's where I ran into you, and I remember that your, I guess, your sous chef or whoever was with you, uh, carrying, you know, helping and getting, grabbing food. Uh, Jay Strauss I just met, but uh, often waiting a long, uh, a long time for a table in his restaurant because I always forget to make a reservation, so hopefully now I'll remember to do that. And, and Sarah, who I also just met, but her incredible, her incredible reputation and contribution to healthy eating in East Harlem precedes her. Um, and I want all, all the panelists to, you know, to thank them because this is not what they ordinarily do, and uh, taking time out of their busy schedule to come here and talk to us is, is really fantastic. Um, and Michael, if you could start off and tell us a little bit about yourself and go down the line. Uh, sure. So, 
Let's see. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks, by the way, for showing that, that little video. Um, I guess you, you know that I'm the chef at Gramercy Tavern. I've, I've been there for about 11 years now, and uh, it's not a chapter that I expected to happen in my life, but a wonderful um, uh, evolution to, to my feeling of uh, connection to this region. I didn't grow up in the Northeast. Uh, I started cooking um, in Japan and had a chance to live in France where I encountered not just the technical side of falling in love with um, cooking and the culture of restaurants but was able to really feel connected to those to those places deeply and when I uh, eventually made my way back to to the States I um, I somehow had finagled a job at the restaurant Danielle and a week into the job when I encountered the chef in the walk-in, he stopped and asked me angrily, who are you? <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe that wasn't quite such a sure thing. Uh, but I, I had a chance to work in, in some wonderful restaurants along the way. And, and uh, from, er, from really uh, at a young age, I've fallen in love with the idea of um, translating all of these things that I've learned and through my travels through an American lens, my, my lens. Uh, and asking ourselves sometimes the most simple questions of who are we and what's important to us, how do we prioritize the way we eat, cook, and ultimately live, um, really probably has brought all of you here this morning and has captivated an entire industry. We've seen that the connection of um, both, you heard me say it in the video, the emotional side of uh, of dining, which is the world that I have lived in with Danny Meyer, right? We describe our work through the emotional qualities, uh, our self-awareness, the, the idea that we're, um, we're leaving people with long-lasting memories. Uh, and yet, um, there's this, this question of, uh, the, we call this the 49%, the technical side. What are the inputs? Where, how are we sourcing food? How are we leaving our world better than we found it? And this is a source of great tension in the world today. Um, I feel lucky at a <clears throat> to be able to talk about these issues from a very particular perspective, um, meaning a high-end restaurant in New York City. Um, it is uh, probably worth a lot of discussion, uh, and I hope that we'll be able to touch on this. Um, that that doesn't necessarily uh, give me an authority to suggest solutions for our community from that perspective. It just allows me to share a lot of enthusiasm, tell some funny stories, and express a lot of interest in, in learning about food. Um, so I am excited to, to be here and excited to hear your questions about, about food in our local food system. My turn? Okay, great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm Adam Eskin. I'm the founder of Dig In. Uh, we are a restaurant group based in New York City. Um, we have 16 restaurants, both in New York and Boston, and one in Westchester County. Um, as we entered this space, um, and we started to think about our idea, um, our role in the world, our role in the food system, uh, you know, that we share, shared and share a lot of the things that Michael was referring to, both in his video and his introduction, um, but really through a different lens and from a different side of the table, right? Which is, um, this movement has been one that's been burgeoning and evolving and growing, um, and to use Michael's words, sort of captivating the industry for the last decade, 15 years or so. Um, you know, our perspective was, you know, what, what if we could sort of capture, um, you know, that ethos, um, that commitment to impact, to community, to good food, mostly vegetables in our case, um, and engineer a model, you know, that would make that food more accessible to a broader audience beyond fine dining and beyond white tablecloth. So it's been a journey. Um, we're a little over six years in. Um, it's been a lot of hard work, a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's a tremendous privilege for me and my team and some 600 of us now in the company um, to come to work every day and do what we do uh, in the hopes of uh, learning from one another, growing, um, and ultimately having an impact. So I'm uh, grateful that Charles included me. As he said, we've known each other for what's approaching a decade now, which is pretty incredible. Um, you know, I'd like to say, to say, or at least think, that a lot of good things have evolved and changed over the last uh, eight to 10 years. So happy to be here. Thanks to everybody for participating, and uh, thanks to our panelists for joining. Hi. Oops. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Sarah Gatanis. Um, I own UGC Eats, which is in the neighborhood here on 118th and Park. We opened not quite a year ago, um, and we are one of the only vegetarian restaurants in our neighborhood. And we have fresh coffee, and we just, we, from living and working in this neighborhood for the past 16 years or so, we saw that there was a real need for this. Um, and that's how we became UGC Eats, which were part of Urban Garden. Center, Urban Garden Cafe, um, and that's about it. <laughs> Give me the short. <clears throat> uh, my name is Colin McKay, but yeah, Charles and I met all the way back in 2001 when we first opened uh, Chopped Creative Salad Company um, with my partner Tony Shore. Pardon me. Um, at Chopped back then um, it was a novel concept, and we knew. Uh, our success or failure would depend on our ability to convince people that salad wasn't a side dish, it could actually be a main course, it could be a lunch and a dinner. <clears throat> and our, our way of doing that was to, to excite people through salad by searching the globe exhaustively for the very best flavors and then working with local farms um, and producers to, to, to find the best ingredients to marry these kind of, these interesting esoteric flavors from around the world, but rooted kind of in our own backyard. And not only with the farmers, but with local artisans who are doing like really interesting things in their, in, in, in their space. And um, we found that like that combination between this global search um, married with this, you know, the local produce and also local artisans uh, added up to what we thought was, you know, the very best salad possible. Um, our mission today remains the same, um, and we continue to kind of think about what the future of fast food um, and the future of salad and vegetable eating is. We have um, 50 locations now in seven states, and um, but over 16 years, that's not that fast, you know, because we, we have a very deliberate approach to growth, and every day we want our food to get better and we won't do anything to jeopardize that. So, um, so steady, steady as we go. Thanks. Hello, I'm Jay Strauss. Um, we only have six locations in 16 years, so I guess we're really slow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. you um, but we're not slow food, so none of that stuff. Uh, I don't know Charles, but Charles, thank you for inviting me and for saying some very kind words. Um, I started Westville in 2003, um, it's a, a very little place in the West Village, and if we had any focus, it was on vegetables, but it was, it was simply because it was the way I was eating, although I'm not a vegetarian at all, but uh, I was eating, it felt like it was the way a lot of my friends were eating, and the idea, hardly as eloquent as my panel mates here, but it's, it was simply to, to eat better food at a good price. Um, so we continued doing it, and it kept growing and growing, and th there's real, uh, I, I can't say I have such a distinct philosophy, um, it's, it's really just trying to keep things a little bit simple, um, and, and just provide food and sustenance at a, an affordable price. So, um, thank you, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, and I want to welcome all the panelists. actually sit over here so you can actually look at look at the audience instead of me. So I guess, I guess the first question I have is is about a responsibility to local farming. I mean you, you all seem to came to it seems like you came to it very naturally at least several of you um, and, and also you know vegetable uh, serving vegetables in a different unique way which really wasn't in vogue always. Um, so let's just start with the local farming if someone can talk about what they, if there's a responsibility, or is it a, is something to as a, as a marketing component, uh, both? What, what what is it, and, and do we have a responsibility as restaurant tours to do that? I'll take a crack at it. Um, you know, we think so. Um, I, think, you know, I think you want to be careful with responsibility. I think one um, as um, a business, um, as an actor in a broader ecosystem. I think you're responsible for that which is important to you. Sorry. You're responsible for that which is important to you. And, and so with our idea, when we started thinking about how could we make this type of food more broadly available, we started with supply. Um, we started with 
the efficiency or inefficiency associated with supply, um, all the different layers in the logistics infrastructure to get food, seeds into the ground, food out of the ground, delivered into a kitchen, you know, prepared, cooked, and served. Um, and so it, it was important to us for two reasons. One, we saw that this was, I think, one of the two bookends that we now take very seriously in terms of how do we have an impact in the food system, it's agriculture, and it's getting more people to learn how to cook. Components. Um, and so, certainly committing to a program around uh, local and small and medium sized farming is important from a mission perspective. Um, um, but, but there's also a sustainability about it, right? You know, the less inputs that go into producing the food, whether it's vegetables over cattle on a plot of land, or it's the distance associated with how long food has to travel before it gets onto your plate. Um, or the different types of soil that you find in different geographies and how they're more optimized to produce certain types of vegetables than others. Right. So um, it's just been pretty fundamental for us. Um, and I think without the work that we've done in the last six years, we have a six or a seven person team that just focuses on supply and, and, and our farming partnerships. Um, if we hadn't done this, I'm not, I'm not sure we'd be where we are today. It, it just seemed like a lot of work. I mean, you know, an important work, but it just is to, from a restaurant point of view, when, when profitability is so critical, it just seems like it, wow, this is a big undertaking. And when you start to talk about the granularity of it, uh, you know, I guess I question and, and, and hope that it's there's good news at the end, that it's worthwhile and, and yeah. it's important. Uh, if I could just add yeah. to that, I mean, all of those are really great themes that I'm sure they resonate with everyone in the room. Um, when you talk about responsibility, um, you know, from a, a perspective of a, a fine dining restaurant like Gramercy Tavern, there's an interesting history to look at the, the origins of our company and, you know, Danny Meyer's own um, kind of belief that each of his restaurants were built for the community in which they, they live. And as I joined the company and admired <clears throat> that sort of ethos from, from the outside, I started to, you know, search for how that, that might connect with my own uh, career and I've always seen um, that you know the, the the kind of binding factor of people um, in in the the niche of work that I do cooks that are dedicated to learning this craft of cooking but interested in, in understanding um, how so many of us haven't necessarily grown up in restaurant families but committed ourselves to this out of a choice a passion um, and we start to see the, at least for me, it, it dawned on me that the, the connective device is really kind of all under the umbrella of, of education. And so early on, when I started working at Gramercy Tavern, um, a parent from a neighborhood elementary school um, seemingly walked by and one day just knocked on the window and came in and asked if her, for her child's first grade class could come and visit um, a restaurant. And it, she was, you know, doing asking a very innocent question. I had been thinking about this day and night for years and years about how can we engage with our community, and so it fell fell into place quite naturally. But um, when I asked to to explore the topic a little bit further, um, you know, it, it was immediately apparent that around the country that there were people who were kind of yearning to learn more about not just restaurants and the excitement that happens behind you know, the, the movement, the colors, but really they wanted, they wanted to feel more connected to the food they're eating. Um, fine dining restaurants happen to have the luxury, you know, resources, time, space to invite people in and do this sort of thing. But that's exactly um, you know, the role that a restaurant like Gramercy Tavern and others can play, is using you know, the, this sense of luxury to translate into learning. And so I do think there's a responsibility. Uh, everyone has you know, um, their own personal take on how they engage with it. But from, from a, a Gramercy Tavern perspective, it's led us to, some of my colleagues are in the audience here, um, to form relationships with organi organizations like Wellness in the Schools that have you know, gone straight for a very specific target of how can we improve the, the food that is served uh, and sourced in public schools. Um, you know, I have to, to, again, once again, be just to be very open and honest, we're uh, completely engaged in these um, subjects, but I still love my day job. It's actually a day and night job. It's a 24-hour, it's a 24-7 24 24 job, but, but we, we've considered it not an extracurricular activity, but part of our DNA. How can businesses... Um, be socially responsible and engage in, within the communities that, that, that they belong to.
Yes. So at, at Chopped, our responsibility, our ultimate responsibility, is to deliver the very best flavors. And it happens that to do that, we need to work with, with local farmers. And of course, that's better for the environment and, and helps with our sustainability initiatives. But we always lead with flavor. Um, and in terms of responsibility, we find responsibility to support those local farmers, but also, as I alluded to before, support local artisans who are doing great things, like if it's seed and mill tahini in New York, or Lenny Boy, who's a, 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 a small kombucha maker in North Carolina, we're able to use chopped restaurants as, a, as almost a advertisement for these people to help them in their business, right? So there's also, for us, like an entrepreneurial responsibility. Um, and I, I agree with Michael, too, that it, a lot of it is education, just as we try to educate our customers. We do know at the end of the day, it, it does start with, you know, wellness, like you mentioned, wellness in the schools, with which we've had an eight-year relationship. My partner Nick's on the board of it. We spend a lot of time in the, in, the, in the schools and on their cafe days kind of telling kids about the same things that we find and delight we find in some of these new ingredients and how flavorful they, they can be when there's this often this gap between what is healthy and what is flavorful, and we try to close that gap. And um, that's like the ultimate community responsibility too for us. So, Cheryl, I have a question for you. <laughs> what, so, you you came into East Harlem and basically started serving vegetables. I mean, that's I mean, I know that's not what you do, <laughs> but there's more to it than that. You also have a garden center, is that, is that, and can you tell us a little bit about why East Harlem, what the plan was, why the the restaurant came after? Yeah. yeah the garden center um, has been in, well, in existence since 1959, more or less. To start. Oh, sorry. Um, Okay, sorry about that. So the Garden Center has been around a lot longer than the cafe, um, but we were doing culinary events at the Garden Center for a couple of years, and people kept saying, why don't you do uh, like a full-time restaurant? Why don't you do it inside the, ca uh, inside the Garden Center? And so actually, the way we started UGC Eats, we had this idea that we wanted to start a restaurant, and we found a space very close to our Garden Center, and we originally just said we're going to use it as an office, but then we saw this when we got the space, we're like, wow, this is so cool. It's, it's these massive windows, and it's right near the garden. And we, having, you know, as I said before, living and working in the neighborhood, we saw that there's really very few options for healthy food. Even just to get a coffee with almond or soy milk in it is not easy in East Harlem. So when we um, decided that we were going to turn it into a cafe, we said, let's do something, you know, vegetarian and something you know, where you can get things like almond milk and coconut milk and soy milk. And people have been very excited and happy to have this in our neighborhood now. And, and I think that coming into underserved communities as you know, if, you know, with restaurants serving healthier, healthier fare is unique. Yeah. Um, I just got an email from Grains asking about, um, I guess they're doing a story, I guess Taco Bell is expanding in the city. I don't, I don't know this, but this is the, <laughs> premise of the story, and that uh, fast food restaurants are, are growing in leaps and bounds here. Um, so I guess my favorite segue to the next question of, of what about underserved communities, and what can, I guess it's pick and choose which one you want to maybe answer, is what can underserved community food service uh, establishments learn from what you've done um, in terms of healthy eating and creative ways of preparing vegetables like, like Jay's done, and, and um, and Adam and everybody else has done. Um, and also, what about coming into underserved communities and, and taking shots and, and, and seeing what maybe grants are available or, or real estate benefits from the city? And, and I don't know what they are or if there are any. If there are, could you please tell us? <laughs> and to go into these communities and, and, and develop your types of restaurants. Um, regarding real estate, I don't, I don't know of any landlords. I'd love to know, but I don't know if there are landlords that are specifically looking to subsidize restaurants to, to serve any community. And, and I don't know. Not landlords, just so you know. <laughs> no, I'm saying real estate, right, exactly. But I'm saying, and I don't know if it's true anywhere where, where you, know, you can get a real estate deal because you're gonna do something good for the community. In a perfect world, sure, and, it, and I'm sure it exists somewhere, but I don't know if it's prevalent at all. Um, I, I, I guess, from my perspective, if you, if it, so, if the economies of the whole thing have, have to 
be in the forefront on some level. And if you keep your prices fair, I'll even say low, um, and you, you're giving good portions, I think that's, that's kind of like the starting point for, for do, I'm going to say do the right thing, but I don't know if that's definitively what I mean. But it's, it's, a, good, it's a good kickoff to um, try, trying to serve people by, by at least allowing them the opportunity to eat at your place. It's affordable, and they walk out of there and feel like they got a fair deal. Um, I love that, that people, that I meet so many people that have eaten at one of our places, and um, you know, it's, I'm surprised sometimes, like, it literally yesterday is in the bank, you know, one of the places, and the teller told me, you know, she's like, oh, you, you look familiar or whatever, but it's like, I had the place across the street, so, oh, you know, I, I love eating there, and I was kind of surprised, you know, it, it makes me feel good, it doesn't, it's really affordable to everyone, and I think that's, if we have a mission statement at all, and really, you know, I'd, I'd really have to ponder it if someone really wanted to hear our mission statement. You know, we make a statement on our website and we talk about what we love to do, but it's not some cerebral, heady mission statement. You know, it's really, it's such a simple thing ultimately. It's really just trying to give, give people a good opportunity to eat good food. And again, it's, it, we also serve fried food, and if that's bad for you, I'm not sure, but, you know, so there's... It is. I, I, I'm rambling, but I'm, I, I guess ultimately I'm just trying... Is it? And, and, does it matter what it's fried in? Is the olive? Is the oil? Maybe that's a different question, but in any case, I don't know. Just, I, I think what matters is to, regarding underserved communities, if, if it's affordable, and I think, you know, you can provide nutrition, I don't really like to give much more. You know, and not to say that I'm in underserved communities. I think is the West Village underserved. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we try hard, and I think we're doing pretty good. Thank you. What? Yeah, a couple of thoughts on the on the topic. One, just <clears throat> I think in general, um, the way we talk about it and think about. It, how we're going to grow our business and you know and the impact that we seek to have um, we just by virtue of what we do the relationships we have in the farming community um, and sort of you know a number of the partnerships we have on the nonprofit side um, we're still really in learning mode as to as we as we grow how how we're going to have the greatest impact one of the things we've learned is it's a big mistake to go into underserved communities and say we're here and we know how to fix it um, don't think that's the solution necessarily. So um, it is about facilitating a conversation and, and partnering with those that are local to that community. You know that share the same values and the same mission, and the same goals, have a strong desire to bring vegetables to the community or whatever it may be. Understanding the dynamic of that community, right, and partnering with somebody locally to facilitate what is it that we do that maybe we do better um, that you don't have access to that we can sort of support. Um, that's one. Two. <clears throat> When you think about the composition of our respective restaurants um, and all the different folks that are um, working in those restaurants and in our kitchens, there's a lot of folks uh, working in our restaurants that do live in underserved communities, right? So day to day, what are we doing about it and how do we think about it? Um, go back to the, the other book and the pillar, which is you know, one of the biggest ways to move the needle is to empower people in terms of how to cook, right? So how to use an oven, how to hold a knife, how to work with a saute pan, fry an egg, um, whatever it may be. Um, so we have a, a pretty meaningful commitment internally. Um, you know, to having people join the organization, whether you've held a knife or you've gone to culinary school or you've been in Chef White's or you haven't, uh, but you have a passion for food and, and a strong work ethic, you know, it's our hope that, you know, one, two, three, and four years from when you join the organization at some point, you know, you can look yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I, I came in with no culinary skills and, and, and now I'm actually a chef, right? And so, the work that we're doing there, our expectation and our hope is that those individuals that work in our restaurants, that they are bringing that knowledge and that empowerment back to their own communities and their own individual households um, and having an impact that way. And I guess just to reframe it, it's not really necessarily the real estate aspect of it, but what you're all doing creative things with food that is very interesting um, and novel. Uh, and that's what I'm sort of getting at. And, and, and Jay, you, you're humble because I think what you do with vegetables is very unique and, and has a lot of power and, and showing that vegetables don't have to be bland and, 
and, uh, and taste bad. <laughs> so I think those are the kinds of things that um, you know we can learn from uh, from from many of your restaurants. And I think Sarah, that you're you're bringing those kinds of things to a community that that needs that. Um, so I guess uh, my next question would be about um, how do you, how do you stay true to uh, local farmers and serving you know chemical free and GMO free foods if you do and what are your thoughts on that? Do you you have to make those decisions on an everyday basis, and are you constantly? Are, is vendor control one of your most important things? Um, um, uh, I'm trying to get the question. Um, yes, um, for us at Chopped, I mean, our philosophy is what we would simply say is like better tastes better, right? That means. Every single ingredient, right? We we look at every single ingredient and try to find that very best ingredient uh, for the value. It, it, it's been our mission from the beginning, and it continues to this day. And again, it it leads you through, you know, this search for the best local farmers and local artisans, etc. And we have a, a you know a strong team in our food and beverage and supply chain division. Then we also have you know, the, a woman named Julia Sherman, who's our creative director, AKA Salad for President. And we do a lot of outreach, trying to find you know, the very best partners. So to stay true, it, it, it is to, to, for us, it's just a constant search for partners who are doing really interesting things and better things, and new ingredients too. So, for us, when we started off and, you know, we, we were working with Satter Farms to use one lettuce, then we're moving into broccoli as to, you know, part of our blend. You know, we're starting to, to think always, and it's our job to kind of anticipate these trends in food and then to reflect it in our salads. So for us to stay true, it's to continue to, continue to search. Um, excuse me. I, so... I guess as everyone here on the panel, we don't really support many local farmers, sorry to say, but um, we do when we can. We, certain vendors, we will buy local stuff mostly in, I guess, the summer months, but it's not our mission, or it just can't be, I guess, I want to say, and historically it hasn't been, primarily because of our price point, you know, and it's, it's not a question of, of greed, it's just a question of the reality of, of what we're doing. Um, so, I, I have very few relationships with farmers. I guess in a perfect world, and I often talk about it, I'd love to have more, but, but I just don't, you know? And if I do a different type of restaurant one day, um, which I probably won't, but <laughs> um, maybe I'll try to start some relationships with local farmers. I mean, I think on my own, I'm, I have relationships with farmers just because I'm, I buy certain types of vegetables, but. Uh, for home use, but um, we, we just, we're just beyond, you know, and this, I, I hate to sound like antithetical to like the, the whole concept of just, just sitting here, but we're just beyond the point where we can really turn back and say, hey, we, we're gonna now do something completely local and, and sort of farm driven. So we're not farm to table. We're organic when we can be, but primarily, you know, I meet people, oh, you know, the, the organic places, all the vegetables. It's like, no, it's, we never said we were. People think maybe because of the color of the place, because we have a lot of vegetables, they, they equate that with, uh, with being organic. Um, we're healthy and we're conscientious and we're nutritious, but um, we only do what we can at this point because it's ultimately, and again, it's, it's probably not what most people want to hear. Maybe probably what I shouldn't even say, but you know, we, we just can't go back and change our price point overnight. You know, sometimes people, you know, how can your chicken's not organic? But it's like, well, that $15 chicken plate with two vegetables is going to go to 21 tomorrow, and then I'm going to hear complaints that your food's too expensive or you got too big for your britches and you're changing. So we're going to keep, you know, stay the course and try to do the right thing and, you know, keep, keep salt to a minimum. I think that's, that's my contribution to society. So <laughs> we're going to just, like, try to not cook with too much butter, not use too much salt, use good oils. Um, but, you know, you, you do what you can do. It's not an all-or-nothing thing, you know, and, and again, just if, if it weren't for the economics of it, um, 
it's not a question of capitalism or anything like that either, but it just, it just, it just unrealistic for us at this point to switch gears and say, you know what, we're doing something wrong by not having organic or local vegetables. I don't think we are. I think we're, we're doing a lot of things right. Maybe there's, you know, it's questionable, you know, that we should try to get some relationships with farmers. There's a couple that we use on occasion, but again, for the most part, our intentions are in the right place, but, but the reality of what we're doing in New York City is, is it's just prohibitive. I, you know, I, w I would say um, whenever you hear a, a restaurant owner speak frankly about these issues, um, it, sometimes it's hard for, for the, you know, the consumer or the public to, to totally recognize that, and I, I think it's important to hear what Jay is saying because um, <clears throat> we've, we've never, as Americans, uh, eaten outside the home more than, than we currently do, and yet, especially in this city, we've never faced more pressure for um, managing independent um, restaurants. Um, the, the, the pressures are from all sides, and even with the longevity of all of our, our businesses, the, they're very real, and um, there, there's nothing sure about them existing tomorrow. So I, I think it's refreshing to hear someone you know, speak openly about the, the challenges of staying in business. Um, and ultimately, um, I think it's important that we think about how we as food enthusiasts share the, the risks and the responsibility <laughs> of eating. You know, we enjoy talking about vegetables and we love, you know, these very feel-good stories of how we engage um, at the green market. And, and don't get me wrong, we do, but I see that as a very luxurious part of my job and I don't take it for granted. I've worked three blocks away so we can push, you saw the wheelbarrow that we, we walk over there. Not many restaurants in the city can even do that. Uh, so it's an extraordinary situation. Um, and yet, I do think that collectively um, there's, there's room for us to dream. And sometimes that dreaming doesn't really have to necessarily be dreaming for, for uh, the unimaginable. Um, you know, we are kind of collectively starting to reconsider the value um, of ingredients that we put on the plate. Whether uh, or not it truly is uh, important to you as a, a, a diner um, that the food that you eat is certified organic, whether that means anything to you, uh, or, or us as consumers in the United States, what is certified organic is a very complicated issue in and of itself. We could spend more time than we have this morning talking about that one issue. Um, but what is important <laughs> to me is that we, um, that we kind of uh, spur each other on to ask questions. And one of the things that I love about the green market is that we can ask those questions. Um, we're asking ourselves questions about um, what does the plate have to look like? And as restaurants, we're bound to try to come up with things that you all will buy to stay in business. At the same time, we have to be daring and think about both you know, encapsulated in this, this uh, spirit of flavor, it, we have to think about reproportioning the dish. If we look around us, we know we can't keep eating the way we have, the way we've all grown up. Um, and that sounds, uh, you know, here I am now drifting out into this subject of, you know, reimagining the proportion of the plates that we eat every day. What does that have to do with Gramercy Tavern? Not a whole lot, but um, we have the luxury of being able to, to dream about these things and artistically start to give priority to certain ingredients. Um, <laughs> shine a spotlight on producers that have interesting new ideas. Start to think about, this is going back a little bit to your prior question, but the, the access that we have to food and, and new interesting ways in which people are coming up with uh, solutions to get it into the city. Um, so uh, while it's daunting, and even um, in some cases can, you know, can be a perilous subject for the, the lifespan of a restaurant, I really think that you know, out of our collective issue and our need for change, there's, 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 it's worth us being daring, rethinking about how we eat, what we eat. Why is it so hard for us to reimagine uh, eating in, in much more simple terms? Reproportioning the, the foods that make up the, the conception of plates, uh, thinking about how fish and meat play a role in the dishes. It's not just about the, um, you know, we tell the story about how vegetables connect us to our region, but maybe there's a, yet a secondary decision here that's much more practical and utilitarian that, that can 
ultimately be um, cost effective um, by, by working out ways to reimagine how we eat and what we eat. So it's a little flighty, but I, I, I want to also encourage us while we recognize the, the restraints, uh, the reality of the world that we live in, it's important for us to continue to dream and push forward. I think that's, that's really great. Adam? If I could add to it, so I, thanks for Westville. Um, I had the grilled salmon salad last night, okay? Um, really? Yeah, yeah. If we're not eating, dig in, or cooking, we're probably ordering Westville. Okay, no joke. Uh, one of my parents' favorite restaurants when they visit the city and so forth. So, you know, I, I would also just applaud you for the candor, you know, and, you know, these, you know, if we're talking about accessibility and the practicality of business in underserved communities versus places like, you know, Midtown Manhattan or the West Village where, um, you know, there's certainly no dearth of, of options. Um, I think we do need to talk realistically about, about constraints. So, w what I would offer is that our, we've all had different journeys, the panels up here, in terms of, you know, our careers and how we think about our restaurants and our businesses. Um, but we, would, we at Diggin would certainly take the other side of, of that view around local um, being cost prohibitive. It's not what we found. We found the opposite. Um, but I think the important asterisk or caveat is that we're a capitalized business and in the a well capitalized business, in the absence of having real resources, you know, a six person supply team uh, co led by one of my colleagues in the back, Taylor, raise your hand. Um, you know, if we didn't put the work into it, um, it it would be it would be cost prohibitive, right? So we really look at farming and agriculture and local as one of the last bastions of a relationship-driven business or relationship-driven history. Um, so it really is playing long ball. It's not short term. It's not medium term. The relationships that we've been building over the last six plus years, um, every year we add more of them, and every year they grow stronger. Um, and you get to a point where. Um, it's not a contract and a negotiation about what the paper says and how many pounds and what price. It's what's working for you as our partner, what's working for us, what are we growing next year, what makes sense. Weather came in, you lost half your crop, the other stuff you were going to sell to another guy but you can't. How can we repurpose that vegetable and bring that into our restaurants? Um, you know, like I said, my colleague Taylor came back from a trip last week. Uh, we have an incredible relationship with one of our many farmers. Um, he had anticipated um, you know, the carrots that he was growing on our behalf to come in a certain way and he was going to sell them at a certain price. Um, and as they finally came in and pursuant to her visit where she spent the day with him uh, on the farm, just kind of catching up, she got a phone call on Monday. He said, look, I can actually make the carrots work for me at a price that was ostensibly 40% of what he initially quoted. And we were happy to pay the original price anyways, right? So you start to develop these relationships and it's two human beings that have shared values. They're sitting across the table, making it work not just in one season, but over five and 10 and 15 years. Um, that's where there are opportunities to make that model work where it isn't cost prohibitive, but it's not without a lot of work and a lot of effort. And that work requires resources and those resources require capital. Um, and, and so in the absence of that, it's, it's, it's very difficult to get done. And, and, and Adam, you, you did sort of reinvent yourself. I mean, early on, mm -hmm. but you did not, not, but you did reinvent yourself in a, in a way, and, and it was really difficult in the, in the beginning stages, I think, in, in terms of figuring out these very granular decisions about whether or not to offer something as organic or not, or and, and purchasing and, and sort of reinventing yourself as a, as a you know, farm-to-counter um, fast, fast service restaurant. Yep. What were some of those issues? Because you were right in the, you had a normal, sort of a more normal establishment. You changed it. Yeah. Um, it's just been very iterative for us. Um, you know, we've for a long time now had the long-term goal in mind. You know, we've, we've had a, a sense at a high level of what we've been seeking to accomplish. Um, and, you know, when I look back over the last six plus years, um, it's, you know, the, the ground is just littered with mistakes, right? But uh, in the absence of being willing to take risks and try things, um, you can't grow and you can't evolve and you can't move forward. So, you know, we've been in the business of trying a lot of different things and trying different ways of making it happen, and it's been bumpy along the way. We're very privileged to, to be where we are now. 
but it hasn't been, you know, with without just as many lows as there have been highs. Uh, but you put enough people in the room that care about the same things, that, you know, are pretty committed to making it happen. Um, you know, there's um, oftentimes, you know, no problem that you can't overcome if, if you're really committed to it. So we've just been working really hard for a long time. And, and Colin, you you've now are in, and you said in eight states, you have seven, seven states. So what about the yeah. purchasing, you know, purchasing having all these different states and restaurants and keeping consistency, I mean, it, does that, that seems daunting. It is, um, well, it's easier almost from a produce point of view as we move south a little bit um, into some of those areas. But definitely a lot of heavy lifting from our food and beverage team and sourcing team <clears throat> to, to find the same quality that we're looking for um, out of some of the, the the producers that are local to the communities in which we're opening. Um, and again, then we're also looking for those kind of, you know, those partners who are, who are doing more artisanal things, right? Whether it be bakeries or beverage producers, et cetera, um, cheese makers. Um, so that's a lot of work in doing all that because we also want to reflect the community that we're in. So we're not just taking items that we're serving on the chopped menu in New York and, and shipping them down to North Carolina, let's say. Uh, we want to establish new relationships there. It's not easy, the whole, you know, the, you know, the bulk of what we do is broadline stuff and getting some of those specialty ingredients is difficult. And it's a lot of work and I don't have to do much of it, but if that's what I hear. Um, and, and thankfully. Um, but um, uh, what was the second part of your question? Yeah, but you know, one thing that I'll that I'll say too, and we're talking about underserved communities, is that you know we're in New York City right now, and in in the talk about how to address these underserved communities, it all does go back to value and flavor, right? You know, I, I was just at Disney last weekend, and uh, that was a really illuminating experience. And it was sad when you when you look at a lot of the people that go there, and then you realize, God, I'm in New York, and I've got my blinders on. Right when you go there, you, it, it, it's you know it's sad to see adults who obviously eat the way that they do, and then it's tragic to see the kids who are eating the way that they do, and it all results in this kind of morbid obesity. And um, you know that's a, that's the end game, creating this this inter like where, where's the value and the flavor to get people to stop wanting the Taco Bell and convenience. Let's not forget that it's convenience as well. You gotta be fast, cheap, and super flavorful. How do you make that healthy? Which to me is kind of, you know, our whole focus and the biggest food trend right now. Creating flavor and health at the same time, taking out salt, taking out sugar for sure. Um, and s the slow creep to the areas of this country where it's also not, you know, New York and inner cities and inner cities in all places, but also the rest of America, that is clearly, according, you know, based on my visit to Disney, you know, suffering, you know, so. Well, what are some of, the, some of the food trends that we could see in the clean eating, healthy eating space? Um, Michael? Sorry, I didn't want to hear you, but I know you have your um, pulse on that. Well, I, you know, I, I was just talking about proportion. We were reimagining what the iconic American uh, diet looks like. We're, we're thinking about um, not so much um, what we're eating that's wrong, but what we're not eating that may be missing from our diet. So earlier we were talking about my current infatuation with Korean cooking, and I had a chance to speak last night about um, traveling to, to Korea. Um, and it's not a surprise that um, there's an impact on um, not just the fine dining world, but um, that's now kind of creeping into uh, and across the country in our American um, uh, excitement over food. And uh, it's a, a much more attractive way to talk about um, probiotics when we're dreaming of you know traditional methods of, of fermentation. So I see that happening from the impact of uh, um, cooks that are coming from, in our case particularly from Korea, that's um, been a, a current theme that um, that has made me feel really excited. 
Um, I, I think that now we're, we're also seeing uh, from, this is again from a, a very particular perspective, um, having chosen to, to work in this field, uh, you know, 25 years ago or so, um, it, it came a little bit late in life for me. My, my parents having helped me get through, get a, an undergraduate degree when I announced that I wanted to do this for a living, you know, cried, why, 25 <laughs> times in a row. Um, but the, the, the reality of it is, is, in the time that I've been in this business, we've seen people looking to chefs and restaurant owners uh, for information, not just um, tastemakers, but for, for real, uh, searching for real um, sources of, of movement. We've seen that in, in the last five or ten years that chefs now have a voice in how we eat. We've seen them reach out to um, the folks that are responsible for uh, breeding plants and starting to ask not just for cute little miniature things, but talking about how flavor um, starts to flavor and and um, and health starts to impact the conversation of breeders themselves who have been dominated uh, over the years by industry and yields and um, survivability of plants. I, I think there's a fascinating world out there that is both um, giving definition to the how we eat uh, in our city and in our region uh, and opening a world of exciting topics for us to, I think at the end of the day it really is about um, while some of these uh, topics may be quite complex, it is ultimately about making us collectively feel um, empowered. There doesn't have to be a separation. This may be a strange thing to have a, a chef sit here and say this, but I, I'm a father too. I have three kids, and I believe that um, the, the most interesting evolution to our story is, is that there's a, a, a growing desire for people to feel connected to the physical world around us, and to feel empowered to be able to make your food and demand access to healthy food. Um, figure out ways that we can eat well for affordable prices. And probably convenience is the most important for us as Americans, figuring out how can we actually lead interesting, healthy lives within the craziness of what we have to do every day. I mean, we're all in the same boat, and I think that this um, this conversation, if it does anything, I hope that it will encourage everyone to say we're not powerless in this story, that we, we can take care of ourselves, we have to demand uh, access. We've, when it's confusing, we have to force ourselves to find information and ask more questions. Um, so I, I feel like that is the, the most exciting trend is that I see around me people's interest in wanting to cook for themselves. Yeah, thank you. I, that, was, that was great. Um, I just want to hear from other panelists too, and then we'll go to the audience for questions. But one of the other things I wanted to you know bring up is is about transparency, and I think that um, I think people are demanding more transparency in the food that we eat, and you know I think that that's you know important and relevant as restaurateurs to create that transparency. I think this is a group that's doing that, but I, I think that that's something that we're, we're all looking for. Adam, any any trends you want to? Friends, um, I, I guess I feel less strongly about you know f forecasting what you know what's going to be the next kale, whether it's broccoli leaf or broccoli or what have you. Um, you know, to, to some of Michael's commentary, one of um, I think the things that we all need to be mindful of: um, business isn't getting any easier. Um, you know, we are in support of, but also in acknowledgement of. Um, the costs associated with labor and how we're paying our cooks and our servers, um, you know, for all the right reasons, that's going up, not down. Um, you know, some commentary earlier, at least the environment here and some of the other markets we're in, real estate's not getting any cheaper, at least not now. <laughs> um, and, and so, what is it that we're doing to be more thoughtful, uh, more focused, more deliberate in the name of efficiency? Um, so wasted food is something that's been on the radar for a couple of years now. There's been a number of folks in the industry, you know, certainly Dan Barber amongst them, that have been really sort of committed to this. You know, you're seeing it go from using broccoli stalks to now using, you know, sunflowers, the actual flowers themselves. Um, so really thinking about the land as finite and the resources in finite and thinking 10 and 20 and 30 years from now, we are going to run out of food if we don't make material changes. So. How are we making choices deliberately so that, given the finite resource that we have, 
um, how can we maximize and how can we get more out of those, whether it's shifting what actually goes in the plate in terms of proportion or using more of the plant or more of the animal. Um, um, and so I don't, just out of necessity and also because it, it makes sense for all the right reasons, I think that this is something that has started to come up over the past couple of years that's going to continue to accelerate. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> about trends, sorry, <laughs> about trends, tre about trends, what oh, you trends? see as trends, yes, in, um, in, in eating. I mean, like everyone's been mentioning, just the healthy eating trend. I mean, we, you see people that like come into our cafe and they find out that they, they come in to order like a bacon, egg, and cheese and we like, we don't have that. And like, oh, I don't eat vegetarian. But then they try something and now they become like a regular. So it's, it's, it's nice to see people are more open to trying different <laughs> things where maybe they wouldn't have been before. Um, and... I don't know. Well, that's a pretty, that's yeah. great, that's a great one. I mean, we have people, like, people that you might expect to eat at our cafe because they see it up from the outside. They see we have all these vintage um, antiques and what have you, and we have, like, what they might consider fancy coffee, but then they come in and they're like, wow, this place, I can eat here. This is great. Like, there's nothing on our menu that's above $10, and we have people of all different um, backgrounds that come into our cafe and now, be, you know, become regular. So it's really pretty amazing. And then I think you know you're taking a chance on an underserved community, and and them showing that they are interested in healthy food is is you know sort of dispels a myth. They, yeah, they do. They totally want to eat healthy. I mean, you, when you go into certain stores in the neighborhood, you can't even find like a piece of fresh fruit. We have organic bananas, and they sell out every day. And fruit salad, you can't buy like a prepared fruit salad. So just some basic things that aren't available that people actually want. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> Um, I, these are pretty obvious, most likely, um, and I think I alluded to one before, where it's the um, the approximation of or the use of alternative ingredients to 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 get the very best flavors that might be out there right now. We call it loopholes. Like for us, we're if, in a salad if we use kelp noodles to approximate, you know, the the feel of a real noodle, um, and it has less carbohydrates. Um, um, and all these kind of loopholes that we use to to maximize flavor, yet still making the salads healthier without um, with, without any loss. Two is sugar is obviously uh, big. Um, we cut sugar continuously in our beverages, in in, in our dressings, etc. Um, personally, that's a big thing for me. And then finally, um, convenience through tech. Is, is, is a big thing for us, our use of an app for in-store pickup, um, other initiatives that we've been working on. These are all things that we're... we're and we're reducing those lines, right? So line, yeah, reducing, lines, reducing, reducing lines, the lines. It's a very long line to get into, the, you know, to all these restaurants. For all, you know. <laughs> Jay? I'm not sure, but I'm listening closely. We, we want an app, Jay, so that we can go into the restaurant and have to wait in line. <laughs> Okay, so I want to open it up to some audience questions. <laughs> Just thank you all for the work that you're doing in the local and national food system and beyond. Um, in terms of innovations, are there any specific, like in terms of the future, you just talked about trends, whether it's food waste, thinking about like, <coughs> biodigesters to help reduce food waste on site, to um, new recipes and working with different chefs, whether it's you know in terms of fermented foods, what are some of the any specific innovations that you're all excited about, um, tech-wise or beyond? I mean, apps, are, of course, are now commonplace and every day, and businesses need them to survive. But um, just interested in hearing all of your thoughts on that. Uh, I'll, I'll share. Two. One, one is a, a, a concrete innovation that we've used, and I, I want to say this carefully because, again, um, working in a restaurant like Gramercy Tavern that's 23 years old, has a wide fan base, very steady business, healthy volume of business, and a high uh, check average. It has afforded us a, a healthy cash flow, and we've been able to use that to our advantage to engage in um, contract growing. And uh, it has been a, um, an idea that has worked for us, being able to spend our uh, money plan to use it in uh, January and February. 
uh, using our record keeping to purchase um, conservative amounts, but um, close to accurate amounts of uh, produce um, from directly from the green market, um, allowing that cash flow to benefit the producers, keeping them in business, definitely tiding them over in times of the year that are uh, very difficult, uh, and then um, easing the, um, the, the pickup and organization of getting in and out of the market, which fortunately is a much busier place these days. So that kind of um, uh, economic initiative has worked really well. And I'll just make mention of another that um, I don't believe is actually in motion yet, but I, I um, uh, heard a friend describe it recently, and um, I'll just I'll share it with you, so maybe it'll get you excited. Um, I think we all can recognize that there's a growing market in so many different sectors for local foods, seasonal foods, healthy foods. Um, we know that there uh, is an increase in our um, local agricultural story in the Northeast. The bottleneck is how do we get those products from small family farms into uh, or close to cities where restaurants can truly purchase them. Um, and uh, I think that there are a lot of interesting ideas of um, distribution channels that are being uh, created to, to do that. And um, two that stand out for me are um, one organized by Grow NYC, the um, uh, Green Market Co., which I think uh, has not yet fully realized its full potential, but uh, has the ability to change the way we all collectively buy food. Um, and then new ideas um, that engage uh, drivers in a similar uh, format to uh, individual drivers within the city, say a, a company um, you know, like Uber that um, uses um, algorithms and formulas to connect rural areas uh, with those food hubs. And I'd like to see, I'd like to see that, um, those sorts of uh, ideas uh, develop. Uh, yeah, once again, thanks so much for all the amazing information. Um, I think a few of you have identified that cooking is a potential solution to a lot of America's uh, sustainability issues in the food system. Uh, but then, would you also argue that like this elevated level of convenience is somewhat the antithesis to that solution? It's just a choice if someone wants to cook and doesn't want just the convenient thing but want to maybe eat. Is that okay that I answer? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, you could probably cook more nutritious food at home than going out. It's certainly, if it's about convenience, I mean, I th I'm pretty sure you can figure out how to eat more, uh, more nutritiously, more healthfully at home. So, yeah, le learn to cook and maybe stay away from some of the, the more convenient methods, the, the, uh, the pre-cooked food at, it's at, at supermarkets or um, maybe certain fast food, I would encourage one to stay away from that stuff. But if you know, if you if you're willing to put the time in and the care and maybe learn a few new things, I think everyone should cook. I, mean, it's, I don't know about everyone here, but it's, it's kind of how I learned to to even do to work in a restaurant. But I desire to cook and desire to eat better and going into it not truly not knowing anything. You know, and just figuring it out. I couldn't afford to eat um, as a young man. So, that's like, <laughs> sorry honey, I can't go out for dinner tonight. I'm gonna learn how to cook this pasta. Yeah. But um, yeah, somehow the bottom's gotta be broadened, right? It's cliche, but it's the truth. And people just have to sort of maybe step back and find out what they like to eat and then figure out how to do it. Anyone can do it, really. I don't necessarily think they're mutually exclusive, right? So um, the domestic food service industry is a seven hundred billion dollar industry. Groceries another seven hundred billion, so it's a trillion and a half. Um, with the advent of technology, um, you know, read the news a month and a half ago. Um, Whole Foods has a new owner, right? Um, all the meal kit delivery businesses. So you know, if you take a step back and just think more broadly about how we consume food, you know, we have seven days a week and plus or minus three meals a day. It's 21 meal occasions. So I think there are a number of ways to solve for those 21 meals. Um, and I don't think just picking one way, whether it's trying to figure out how to serve high quality, uh, sustainably sourced, freshly cooked food for 10 or 12 bucks in a, a quick service or a fast casual environment. 
um, versus you know using that um, as a mechanism by which you can empower those that work in your restaurants to learn how to cook and, and bring that knowledge home. So um, it's such a massive, ubiquitous problem from agricultural all the way through and sort of healthcare and obesity and so forth that I think we've actually got to be parallel processing uh, across all these fronts to actually move the needle. Hi. Um, I'm going to continue the question around transparency, and I'll preface this by saying I know it's a layered, complicated question, um, but I work in the industry and I talk a lot with chefs and farmers about it, but the idea of storytelling and sharing about your sources and where you're purchasing from, whether it's on your menu, face-to-face, -face, online, um, I know some of you do more of it than others, and I'm just curious um, why you make the choices you do about sharing or not sharing you know, specifically the stories and where you purchase from. You oh, I'm just a food system consultant, so I'm freelance now. Okay. Can you just do it and not talk about it, though? Not say it came from this farm or that farm, and just know that you're doing something that... Maybe... But then how do people know that you're doing it? Even maybe. if you don't just specify, just... Uh, maybe, that, maybe they don't have to know, you know? <laughs> I, I want to I want to jump in uh, and and actually chime in with Jay and uh, just in full transparency I think we probably I, I don't know if you're asking me this question but we've had this conversation before and um, in in a way there is something refreshing about being able to um, not necessarily broadcast that that information and it, it's contradictory in a way because. You know, especially in the way that I built the menu at Gramercy, every single decision is very carefully chosen. Uh, every, each ingredient tells a story. Um, but we've also kind of been careful to, this is more of an aesthetic, we just didn't want to overload people with information. Not everyone in our restaurant really wants to hear all of the, my wife calls it viral gastro verbiage. Um, sometimes we can really turn people off to the idea when, when you know, we're passionate about that subject, but it may not be the right time, the right place. Um, but what it does do, um, we, we take it seriously at the restaurant, so we're ready, we're kind of eager for that conversation to happen, but we just listen carefully. So rather than the, every title uh, on the menu, every, every dish not being a paragraph long, it actually, I tried to keep it as short as possible, and not hiding information, but really just hoping someone will say, why does it taste like this? Where does it come from? You know, tell us, tell us a little bit. So it's the hope that that conversation will happen without hitting people over the head with the information. And I might be missing some opportunities. I think about it every single day. Are we, are we, are we really living up to our responsibility? Are we, are we missing opportunities to share our passion and tell those stories? Maybe, but I'm, it's a, it's a chance I'm willing to take as long as behind the scenes we're ultimately sharing that passion with the people that we work with and that I think the moments will come out in, in our engaging people in, in you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one and, and small conversations. That's a, so just to interject one thing quickly because I, I know you don't want to hear from me but I just want to put something out there which is that, and I, and I agree with what you're saying, um, you don't have to shoot from the raft, rooftops of everything. However, it is important to at least have knowledge that this is the kinds of things you're trying to do, and I think that can come out with your marketing messages, but I won't mention the chain, they're not here, but some chains do do that. They try to list everything, but you know, as a consumer, and this is not as my role as a food policy director or anything, when I go into some of these establishments and I see some of the things they're saying, and then I know for a fact that they're different uh, because I see the uh, people preparing things that don't match, um, you know, it concerns me. So I think, again, before Michael just talked, I had a different opinion, and now I have a, you know, a better opinion about them, <laughs> because I realize that it's complicated to sort of put out messaging about this is the farm we're using, this is the exact ingredients, and then it changes day to day. It, it lessens your flexibility um, as a, you know, to get the best produce, to, get to, to, to go to different farmers, to be cognizant of the uh, different temperature changes and weather and crop issues and things like that. Just, just can I add just a counter? Like, um, for us, and we're, I think, lousy marketers at Chopped, we're getting better. Um, and it's really a kind of, it's a shap, it's a, it's a way to support 
on other entrepreneurs. So we'll pick certain items that we're proud of that we found um, and have gotten to know the people behind it and then want to support them and help them get their business to, to grow. And so then we'll, we'll work on kind of a marketing thing with them in terms of whether it's social media or uh, in restaurant marketing um, versus just kind of, and there is a lot of this out there, and just kind of the listing of every single thing and then it just becomes noise versus, hey, in a conversation with your customer, um, check out what we found you might really like it, you know, we, we searched hard for it, and, uh, you know, and at the same time supporting the entrepreneur behind it. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for coming and uh, giving us so much information. I am fortunate enough to have a friend, and uh, she has been in nutrition for over 30 years. She has her master's. <laughs> and she has a show called Health's Kitchen. So she's been teaching people how to eat vegetables. And with a variety of uh, different cultures, she's included. And to see the next generation coming up, I'm so privileged and proud to see our uh, guests here tonight and also to see the young people and their desire to change uh, the way we treat our bodies. So thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you to you on the panel and also you here in the future continue to grow and develop and I feel very hopeful. Thank you. 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 Vegan Organic. Restaurants. Speaking of trends, when are you going to start seeing marijuana infused food on Smoky Mountain? <laughs> Not that far away, is it? <laughs> Well, we are trendsetters, my darling, but I don't think we're going to go... You don't have to answer that. As a former lawyer, you don't have to answer that. Uh, well, this is the last question. Hi, uh, this is not so much of a question, maybe about a statement just like she, um, that, that lady made. Um, I, I, I'm a private chef. I also do a lot of volunteering with City Harvest. Uh, I think many of you are aware of the work City Harvest does as a food rescue organization. The one thing that I want to mention is also the work they do with, within their nutrition education programs. They have a lot of programs um, that are mainly focused in uh, underserved communities and low-income communities where they teach classes uh, for six weeks, and uh, you know they do a fabulous job with that. And I think it's it's not what they're known for, but it's 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 what you guys have all discussed for you know a good part of the last hour is about education and educating you know especially underserved communities. And as a chef volunteer in those programs, I find that there are so many people in underserved communities that are so passionate about learning how to cook and learning how to cook vegetables uh, in a better way. Because they, they're like, they're just used to like the bland, steamed, boiled vegetable. And you know, the first question we ask during those programs are, what are you here to learn? Like, what's, what are you interested in? And many of them have health issues. Many of them realize that they do need and they do want to eat healthier. They just don't know how. And these are communities where even like eating brown rice instead of white rice, or you know, learning how to make a healthy salad dressing or a healthy roasted vegetables, uh, you know, it's very important. And the key is always affordability, accessibility to food. So it's to choose and teach them how to use simple vegetables that are readily available in their local markets. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. There are many people in the audience that may be chef or nutritionist or involved in the, um, 
in, in, in this industry and just check out the work that City Harvest is doing and maybe being, get involved. And I know many of you are connected with the uh, Wellness in the School program, which is also fantastic. But that's another program that, by the way, serves age, you know, kindergarten, school kids age to seniors. Uh, that it's uh, that does a fabulous job in educating, especially underserved and low-income communities. Thank you for the discussion. It was very, very interesting. So I want to I want to thank uh, thank you very much, and you know, thank you, Michael, Adam, Sarah, Colin, and Jay. Those are really wonderful thoughts and I have to say you know I we do a lot of these panel discussions we do them probably about 15 a year this is the one that I was actually I had a little a little nervousness about this one I wanted to make sure it went well because I knew many of the panelists thank you so much for the wonderful discussion make sure to check out nycfoodpolicy.org uh, make sure to sign up for our weekly news digest and check out our site which is about three unique stories a week um, our next event is on November 2nd which is about food insecurity feeding all uh, the food insecure in New York and on November 30th is our all-day food is medicine conference and uh, I want to thank Adam and dig in for they're going to be uh, helping to sponsor the event providing free lunch to about 200 people which we're really excited about um, it's an all now you're committed Adam <laughs> um, and I just <laughs> they were committed before and I just I think it's it's um, this event uh, on November 30th is, is something that's very special we have more than 25 speakers coming to that to it and um, space will be limited. Uh, if you do sign up, please make sure that you do come. Because uh, even for this event, we had over 500 people RSVPs, which left out about 150 people on the waiting list. So uh, not to feel guilty, but just make sure that you, if you do sign up, that you do come, because it is very limited space. And we have probably about 1,500 to 2,000 people that want to come to the event, and it is a free event. So thank you so much for coming today, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for